yes, thank you very much for, for coming. Yes, sir. Um, My pleasure. Thanks yeah. for coming too. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Now, I, I had a question because following your rhetoric about the sort of... My rhetoric? All right. Oh, it's yeah, been upgraded. I thought way I was of, just of, pouring of, things of out funding, from the heart. But, um, no. um, I was wondering, would you have encouraged um, governments during the financial crisis to bail out then less banks uh, if this is a better way of, of, of funding the capitalist economy? It's a very good question. Um, and in fact, you could see, if you remember what happened in 2008 when US Congress and government were saying, we're going to bail out Lehman, and then we're not going to bail out Lehman, and then we're going to bail him out, and then we're going to bail out the other guys, and TARP didn't go through initially. It was mayhem. So it's very important, and this is about sort of prudential management, that when you represent central power, central bank, um, that the messaging be very consistent. The notion of surprising investors about something having to do with resiliency, prudential and systemic resiliency, is a very, very dangerous concept. But my preference wouldn't have been that. My preference would be for no banks to have to be bailed out, or insurance companies, or any other financial companies. And the issue with finance, and the reason why it's different with, from other businesses, is all we work with is money. <coughs> And so leverage, and if you look at any of these situations, not just the crisis of 2008, if investment banks in the US or banks over here hadn't been leveraged 30, 40, 50 times, not one of them would have gone bust. If you eliminate excessive leverage, all your problems go away. And that's the point that I'm making is, few people know that that leverage on the way up is subsidized by all of us. Let's remove the subsidy if any financial, by the way, it could be an exchange, could be anyone, well, we don't leverage like this, where our leverage at the most would get to about two times. Uh, but if you remove the fiscal incentive, you say, well, you've reached a level at which a central bank deems that leverage is excessively risky, no more deductibility, the leverage will stop. You don't, have, you don't need any sort of rules or, it will stop just because it's economically not viable anymore. And, and that leverage, is obtained at the cost of massive taxation on risk capital. So if you are in an environment where leverage, by the way, it was not just a failure of fiscal policy, it was clearly a failure of governance, because these companies were badly managed, they leveraged too much. The problem with leverage is it's not a static instrument. It's not a linear uh, type model. You leverage a bit, and then you get a little pickup in your earnings. And if the general environment is positive, leverage a little more. So you get a bigger growth in terms of your earnings. You get a bigger bonus pool. But then you have to keep on leveraging. So it's really an exponential. And we've been through this so many times. And every financial crisis has been exactly the same process. We are unable to control leverage. So let's stop subsidizing it at a level where it becomes dangerous. You won't have to bail out any banks. If leverage is subsidized, which it was, if governance fails, which it did, if regulation, regulation fails, which it did, regulators didn't see it coming, no one said, whoa, leverage 30, 40 times is too much. That didn't happen. But it was also fundamentally, this goes back to 1987, with the crash of 87, where the central banks flooded the market with liquidity. Keeping in mind what happened in 1929, because we always seek to or think we're learning from the mistakes of the past, central banks, two things happened after 1929. Central banks put the rates up. I recommend the, uh, the book by Liakat Ahmed, by the way, um, The Lords of Finance, uh, which kind of shows that the crisis of 1929, crisis of 2008, when I read the book, it's almost verbatim, repeat, exact same causes, effects, slightly different environment because you had a gold standard, but pretty much the repeat of exactly the same conditions and, and, and behaviors uh, uh, that we uh, suffered from in 1929. So if you don't, subsidize excessive leverage, you're not going to have bankruptcies. The one thing that was effectively the fuel to the fire is post-1987, the Fed decided to flood the market with liquidities to prevent a liquidity crisis. 1929, there was also something that's starting to threaten us now, combination of Fed raising rates and cutting back access to liquidity owing to the gold standard, but also the smooth holly, the tariff act, protectionism. So if you get a combination in a crisis environment of retrenchment, it can be political, anti-immigration, it can just simply be economic protectionism, together with tightening of rates and access to liquidity, that's how you get a huge disaster. So in 87, the Fed 
and other central banks said, this time we can't make the same mistake. Let's reflate. Let's put a lot of uh, free or cheap liquidity monetary easing, if you want, which actually lowers the cost even more of leveraging the balance sheet. So you had a combination of massive availability of cheap capital, governance failure, regulatory failure, and fiscal encouragement to all of this. The point I'm seeking to make is that in that environment, you have no choice but to bail out a massive institution which collapse or bankruptcy would basically represent bankruptcy for the whole world. There's no nation today. Uh, I think at the time, by 2012 or 13, the US had, and, and the European Union had each invested about $6,000 billion in terms of investment, bailing out not just banks, but injecting liquidity in money market instruments just, just to keep the system afloat. But, but putting that aside, there's no country today that on its own, even the United States, which represents half of global financial asset, can bail out their industry, financial industry, if they fail. We're all interlinked and imbricated. The solution we suggest is remove the fiscal subsidy at levels, not, not at the early levels, but at levels where leverage becomes uh, too risky for the real economy. You won't have any bank failures. You won't have subsidy on the way up and subsidy on the way down. And by the way, if you wisely reduce the taxation on risk finance, you're going to substantially encourage entrepreneurs, make it easier for them to raise the smaller amount of risk finance, not debt finance, than they need to create businesses. That, I think, is a solution. In an environment where we still have that imbalance in favor of debt, you have no choice. You have to bail out those super large, super systemic organizations. The um, consequences of even a company like Lehman going bust, I had the others, all the other guys were bust. Uh, all the other big investment banks were in the same situation. Had, They'd not been bailed out, had tarped, not been passed on the second round. I don't think any of us would be here tonight. I certainly wouldn't.